I am Ashutosh Varshne. I uh, direct the Saxena Center, and I'm a professor here in political science and at the Watson Institute. And it's a real pleasure to welcome Parth Jindal amidst us. Um, Parth uh, graduated in 2012 with a joint concentration in political science and economics, and later earned an MBA from Harvard Business School, where he will uh, discuss Jindal uh, JSW Steel tomorrow, a case that uh, HBS has chosen for discussion for the MBA class. Um, uh, JSW St uh, Steel is the flagship company of the JSW Group, um, and he'll probably say something about it. Parth worked very closely with me when he was here um, between 2010 and 2012, those, those years, his junior year and his senior year. Uh, junior and senior, that's correct. Um, and since graduation has been um, um, in, not only in touch with me, but uh, has been a great supporter of Brown University in general and Saxena Center in particular both here and in India, and we greatly appreciate his um, very affectionate commitment to Brown. Um, um, I will um, talk to him about three things. Um, one, his, one is about the economy and industry in India, his overview of where India's economy is going, what the prospects are, and his own career um, as a business leader. Um, perhaps he could tell us, uh, and the audience here, um, something about what the most exciting projects for him after Brown and after HBS have been in India. Mm. Second, and I, I know that you know, some of, many of you have written to me about, about this second topic, which is sports. Um, he um, heads JSW Sports. Um, he heads JSW Cement also and JSW Paints and JSW Energy. Um, and of course has played a very important role in JSW Steel, which is headed by his father. And that's the flagship company. I think that's the biggest company of all. Um, but as uh, the founder of JSW Sports, uh, of course, he's very well known for um, co-owning uh, Delhi Capitals, which is my team as well. Um, and after every Delhi Capitals game during the IPL, we chat, or we, we send each other um, um, uh, WhatsApp messages about who played well, who played you know, badly, and why did we lose, and why did we win, etc. Uh, but uh, a more, uh, in, to me, and I'm partly familiar with this, but he'll tell us more, more exciting sports project has been the Inspire Institute of Sports, where the objective is to create gold medalists for, in the Olympics. And they have only one thus far, Neera Chopra, for javelin throw. And uh, they want many more by the time it's LA Olympics. And they got how many at the Asia? Uh, 17. 17 medals in the, in the Asian Games, so uh, three, four weeks back. That's it. That's it. I think it's a very exciting project. But India, a, a, in terms of athletics, India has been a severe underachiever. Right? Cricket is self-piloted. All of us know that. Cricket needs no support. It will it'll be on its own. Um, but uh, but athletics need that, that is a field domain that needs a lot of work and I have admired his work. I've been to IS myself, um, uh, about an hour away from, well, not too far from Bangalore uh, in Vijayanagar. Uh, but we sh I, I want to hear him uh, say something about that. And um, the third uh, is simply uh, corporate careers um, and uh, in India for. Many of you, that's an important matter. Some of you would like to go. Uh, 
go back and some of you who are Americans might want to explore uh, corporate careers in America, in India. And uh, so just his overview of what it means to have a corporate career in India as a young man or a young person, young woman. And uh, we have a list of internship opportunities that have been advertised. Uh, a lot of you would probably have a copy with you. Um, the, the list is here, so he'll probably say something about the list also. These are JSW internships and project opportunities in India. So with those uh, words, um, uh, one more thing. Uh, the, our, our conversation will be about half an hour, and half an hour will be Q&A for you. And then there is an hour-long reception where you can pursue the conversation with him outside. Mm? So we have two hours of his time uh, before he goes away to HBS tomorrow. <clears throat> so welcome, Parth. Um, uh, thank you, Ashu. Thank Ashu. you for your visit. And, uh, and once again, uh, thank you for your continued um, unflagging commitment to Brown. So I'm so glad that as a, you, you continue to have this affection for the college where you received education. <clears throat> no, no, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, Brown, Brown is a very special place, and I'm very jealous of all of you uh, because you all are spending time here at Brown. It's the best four years of my life so far. So it's always really a pleasure to come back. And uh, I'm, I'm coming back after seven years. And to see the kind of growth and development of Brown is truly amazing. So under President Paxson, I think the university has come a long way. And I'm glad to be here and share some of my experiences with all of you. So uh, let's start with industry and economy. Yeah. Um, could you tell us what, as, a, as an industrialist, as a business leader, uh, your view of, of the the current state of Indian economy and its future prospects are, before we get to your own specific industrial experience with JSW. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, I think we're living in an unprecedented time in India right now. I think if you look at the Indian economy today, uh, it's a $3.8 trillion economy. And over the next decade, uh, I, I would be very, I'm very confident that India will be a $10 trillion economy. So we're talking about the economy trebling in size uh, in just a decade. What's taken India 75 years to get to, in, the, in a very short period of time of 10 years, India is going to grow three times. And growth is all around us in India. Um, I, I have a few numbers that I, I can share. Last year, India consumed uh, 120 million tons of steel. And this year, the projected demand is about 135 million tons. Uh, so that we're talking about 12 to 14 percent growth in steel demand just domestically. Uh, and I'm not even talking about the export opportunity. Similarly, in cement, last year, India consumed 380 million tons of cement. We were the second largest uh, cement consumer in the world. And this year, India is likely to consume about 435 million tons of cement. So again, we're talking about 12 to 13 percent growth. And this goes across the board, right? You look at the banking sector, you look at petrochemicals, you look at industrials, you look at sports, you look at any industry. Uh, the growth is at a breakneck speed. And I think the work that has been done, you know, by the UPA government and then by the NDA government of creating India as a digital economy uh, with Aadhaar, uh, with demonetization, with the GST, uh, which, was, which is a unified tax code for the whole country, uh, you know, with the bankruptcy code coming in place, a lot of the informal sectors have become formalized. A lot of the black economy and the black markets have become white and have become, you know, professionalized. And, and it's, it's actually a, a, a phenomenal opportunity. And I think it's the opportunity of our time. Uh, India is the opportunity of our time. Yes, there are issues. Yes, there are political issues. Yes, there are social issues. But just taking an economic lens, uh, it is the most exciting uh, opportunity. And I think it's, it's something that everyone should experience. 
and uh, we are very motivated to get brown students to come and experience uh, the opportunities through the lens of JSW and whether you are planning on moving back to India or not uh, whether you're planning on working in the United States or any other country I think this is the right time to come and experience growth and experience what it must have been in the United States in the 1800s or early 1900s, in the Gilded Age, as they as they call it. Uh, India is living through that today, and it's it's truly a fascinating uh, opportunity. Yeah, so the Gilded Age America after Civil War, those of you who are familiar with American economic history or American history know what that term means. Uh, it was invented actually by Mark Twain in 1873 to describe what was happening in America after 1865. So this whole period, 1865 to 1900, uh, the economic history books are clear that was the fastest growth any economy until that time had experienced. Roughly 6% a year. 6% was a very big deal at the time. It's not such a big deal anymore. It was a very, very big deal for Enam at that time. There were two uh, periods of minor depression, 72 to 76 and 92 to 96. But anyway, overall growth rate, that means in some year growth, years the growth rate was 8% or 9%. Yeah. which is now considered explosive, which is what China achieved. And then actually South Korea did before that. Um, uh, so that's the uh, you know, emergence of U.S. steel, emergence of uh, rail, railroads and the Rockefeller um, uh, uh, um, oil companies um, yeah. and the birth of uh, uh, huge banking, investment banking at that time. So this is all goes back to that period, basically. So you're saying that India is going through that kind of period in terms of entrepreneurialism and, 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 and growth rates. Um, now tell us about, uh, about JSW. What is it that you found very exciting? And I also want you to tell us about uh, our last conversation when you said that the next venture could well be electric vehicles. So let's start with... Uh, Whatever you want to talk about, steel, paints, cement, and what was most exciting for you as a, as a young entrepreneur? Yeah, no, I think means a little bit about my journey. So I, I uh, graduated from Brown in 2012. Um, I went, went and worked for a hedge fund in New York. Um, and my motivation on joining a hedge fund was purely to understand how uh, investment professionals in uh, the developing world or in the developed world view entrepreneurs in the developing world. So I worked at a hedge fund, uh, which was a long and short hedge fund uh, in New York, which invested uh, a lot in emerging economies. Uh, and, and, a lot of, and, and I was privy to a lot of the discussions that they had on what made them take those investment decisions or those shorting decisions. After I worked in New York, I moved to Japan. I worked for JFE Steel uh, in Tokyo. Uh, JFE invested uh, 15, they bought a 15% stake in JSW Steel. Um, and I went there to learn how auto quality or auto grade steel is made uh, because of the whole just in time and because of the whole, uh, you know, quality focus that the Japanese have. Uh, India at the time was importing the outer panels, the skin panels of vehicles from Japan and Korea. And we were the first company to set up a unit to manufacture that. So I went with a team of 300 engineers from JSW Steel um, to learn how they did uh, quality control, to learn how did they, they did just in time. Then I came back to, to India. I, I worked at uh, JSW and... It was at that time that I had the unique opportunity. So my father, he was very clear. He said, you know, you can join JSW Steel or you can join JSW Energy. Uh, at that time, those were the two listed entities that we had. Uh, but I wanted to do something different. Uh, we had a few loss-making businesses uh, within the JSW group. We had our U.S. steel business. We had our cement business at the time and an and a IT company at the time. Uh, which were all losing money. So I uh, approached my father and, and uh, requested him to take charge of all three loss-making businesses. So he was thrilled. He said, somebody wants to look at loss-making businesses. That, that's very good. If you can turn it around, great. If you can't, uh, we anyway want to shut it down or sell them. So you, you figure it out. So that's when uh, my journey with cement uh, started. Uh, I did that for 
about a year and a half uh, before I went back uh, to Harvard for my MBA. Uh, it's at Harvard where, where I came up with the idea of getting into the paint business. And uh, today we are the fifth largest paint company in India. Um, and, and yeah, and I joined, I got, joined the business back in 2016. I've been heading the cement business and the paint business. And my passion is sports, which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about a bit. But um, what, I, what I wanted to talk about, you know, about the JSW group is that, you know, when you look at, when you look at JSW, you may think, hey, it's a, it's a manufacturing company. Uh, it's not for me. Uh, but within any business, there are various areas that one can focus on, whether it's engineering, whether it's finance, whether it's sales and marketing, whether it's HR, whether it's, uh, you know, the, the corporate social responsibility or the foundation work. Uh, and for any business, to run any business, you need general skills, you need to have general management skills, and you need to have your specialized skills. Um, and the opportunities are, are so immense in, in you know, pick any segment uh, and any sector you want, uh, that, that truly I, I found that the skills I learned in the cement business are relatable to the steel business, are relatable to the energy business, are relatable to the paint business and now we're getting into electric vehicles, we've started a venture in defense, uh, we're looking very actively into the copper industry to manufacture copper in India. So overall I think, I think I, I just, I feel that, you know, we're in such a position where India as a country has immense engineering talent. Uh, there's a there's a real need and thirst for job creation in the country and there's an unsatiable demand both domestically and with the whole China plus one strategy playing out with the world wanting to move away from China. I think it's the it's an opportunity for India to really capitalize. So the 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 key in India to be successful and this is what I've seen is there are very few groups that know how to execute well. So being Good at execution is very important. Uh, and the second very important thing is corporate governance. There are a lot of fly-by-night operators who are close to a political party or close to uh, you know, people in power. I think as the economy matures, these fly-by-night operators will be gone and will be replaced by more institutional players. Um, and that's what where we are really focused uh, at JSW is that you know, it doesn't matter who's in power, uh, you know, you just have to put your head down, do the execution right, and the the country, the demographics are so strong that that you will do well. A little bit about maybe briefly about why electric vehicles. Yeah, sure. So so you know today uh, India is a, a four million passenger vehicle market, uh, and it is dominated by Maruti Suzuki, uh, which is a joint venture between Maruti, which is an Indian company, and Suzuki Motors of Japan. Uh, they they come they command about fifty percent of the market today. Two million out of the four million uh, sold by them. The balance uh, is kind of bifurcated amongst the Koreans, which is Hyundai and Kia. Uh, and then you have Tata Motors, uh, you have Mahindra, uh, who make up the, the rest, and then you have, uh, you know, a long tail of players. The Japanese and the Koreans are not convinced on uh, the electric, the lithium-ion technology. They feel that the hybrid technology uh, and then the hydrogen cell technology is going to be the technology of the future. So whether in Japan or in India, they have not gone down the electric path. And as a result, we see a very big opportunity where the incumbents are trying to protect their home turf. They're trying to protect their internal combustion engine uh, industry because they have very large investment in these factories. They don't want to uh, shut it down. So we feel that there's a massive opportunity to enter and to, to really command the electric vehicle space almost in the similar way that Tesla has done it in the United States. Um, only only cars or also scooters and motorcycles? No, only four-wheelers. Four uh, and then we'll go up, we'll go to buses and trucks, but not to the two-wheelers because that's a very fragmented space already. Um, so we think that India from four million passenger vehicles is going to be 10 million passenger vehicles by 2030. And out of those 10 million, the entire auto industry is saying that only about 20% will be EV. Our thesis is it will be more than 40%. Uh, 
and that's the opportunity we are seeing um, and that's why we are uh, making this foray into electric vehicles now let's switch to sports <laughs> i can see some faces already there are some people here for only for your 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 just your sports involved involvement in indian sports and I, i'm not sure they want to hear maybe maybe couple of minutes on delhi capitals or cricket but they really the more interesting issue here more a more exciting issue here really creating gold medals for for olympics right and what is the plan how does it how does something like that work so two minutes on cricket and then then gold medals in the olympics yeah so i think i i can only talk two minutes on cricket because my passion is the other one but but uh on on cricket i think we saw it as a very large uh, uh, opportunity uh from a financial point of view uh as well as you know b- owning an IPL team has a lot of synergies for the JSW group and the JSW brand because as JSW goes from a B2B a business to business player to a more B2C player which is a business to consumer player uh brand recognition is very important if you look at our businesses steel we compete with Tata steel cement we compete with the birlas who've been in cement for hundreds of years paint we compete with asian paints which is a household name in the country so we wanted to build our brand and we felt that there's no better way to build your brand than through cricket and and uh, th- so that's that's one second as india's disposable income goes up uh, the younger generation you know uh, all of you gen z and and my generation and and you know till till uh, they we are all uh, wanting to move away from sa- from savings and also move away from buying materialistic things to experiences and as a result the amount people are willing to spend on events like sports going and viewing a match going and buying a jersey going and buying a token going and buying you know going online and and buying those those cards and all of those uh, things is only going to increase so we took a call that we should end cricket because the tailwinds are very strong and uh, yeah we we invested in in delhi capitals in 2018 um, at a very attractive valuation and today each ipl team is worth uh, almost a billion dollars uh so it's it's been great um so yeah that's on cricket um on 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 olympics. on olympics yeah so i played squ- squash uh, for brown um and and um, you know I, i i made it to the team only one for one year um, but 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 I, i played one year of, of squash for brown and i saw the kind of facilities uh, that were available in the us uh across different universities uh across high schools i also i went to boarding school in england so i i got to see the kind of facilities that were there in england um uh, i worked in japan i i, I was there uh, in japan during the london olympic games and i saw the kind of passion and craze that was there within the japanese society for olympics and then i i recall all my memories growing up watching you know 2000 sydney olympics india won one medal karna maleshwari weightlifting bronze medal 2004 rajavardhan rathor shooting one medal silver medal 2008 was the first time since 1980 india won a gold medal and we heard our national anthem play india won three medals in one in wrestling one in badminton and one in shooting, shooting. then it came london olympics where we won six medals which was the best ever olympics india has ever won um and that was again badminton boxing wrestling and uh shooting but no gold no uh gold. no gold no Silver gold bronze, yeah. no gold in yeah. 2012 so i i always wondered uh, as a country of 1. Point, at that time 1.2 billion why we don't win medals uh, at the olympic games so much talent uh so much uh potential but no medals and it it was very clear no infrastructure no knowledge of sports science no knowledge of nutrition no and no coaching i mean not at that level and uh i was like okay i came back from brown uh this was a very big passion project for me uh the the first ever uh project that my father gave me was 
you know, we make steel, Tata makes steel, but in the consumer market, Tata is commanding a 10% premium on a commodity product like steel to JSW. Can you fix it? And when I went into the market and when I studied it, I realized that the brand power of Tata was enormous because from the water we drink to the salt we eat to the tea we have to the television we watch to the cars we're in, everything is Tata. So I said, we need to build our JSW brand. And I pitched a very wild idea to the board of JSW Steel. I said that I'm going to build India's first high performance Olympic training center. And through this Olympic training center, I'm going to win medals for India. And if India wins a medal at the Olympic Games, the brand of JSW will go very high. Because JSW has played a pivotal role in winning medals for India. And the, the goal was at that time one medal. I mean, the dream was one gold medal. That I will, through my institute, be able to build one medalist for India. That was the pitch. And I had told them that I will win a medal by 2024. That was my pitch. I said it takes 10 years to build an Olympic champion and uh, we need to start at the grassroots level. Uh, so, yeah, so 2012, uh, we started. Uh, so it took, uh, it took me three years, visited all the uh, high-performance centers across the world, studied the different models that countries follow. So studied what the U.S. does as the most successful Olympic nation, studied what Japan does, studied what China does, what Great Britain does, what Australia does visited high performance centers around the world. So the US Colorado Springs facility, uh, visited the Aspire Institute in Doha, the South Australian Institute of Sport in Melbourne, the English Institute of Sport in Manchester, and uh, built a blueprint of the Inspire Institute of Sport. Uh, took us another two years to build it and 2017, uh, the center came alive. Uh, today we have five centers in India. We have six and a half thousand uh, athletes who train under us. Uh, we won three Olympic medals so far for India, one in the Rio 2016 Olympics in women's wrestling, uh, won our first gold medal, which was Neera Chopra in the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, and Bajrang Punya in the men's wrestling in Tokyo. And my commitment bronze. to the bronze, my commitment to Prime Minister is uh, five medals from Inspire Institute in Paris. Uh, so, so, so yeah, that's, that's the story. And, and the, and the very interesting thing is the way we approached it. Uh, we said if we can sell steel in every town of India, then we can have a scout in every town of India. Today, JSW Steel, JSW Cement, all our companies have sales representatives in each and every town of India. And when I say town, I define it as a population of 100,000 people. So now we have scouts in every single town of India and we have coaches because, you know, certain sports are played in certain parts of the country. So when you look at wrestling, you, you have a huge amount of wrestling happening in the Hindi belt or the North belt, yeah, Haryana. Haryana, Punjab, Uttar Pradesh. You have some in Karnataka, some in Maharashtra, but mostly so we and there are famous coaches in these areas. We mapped through software, we have a list of all these coaches. Each coach is now on our roles, on our payrolls. Now, what do I mean by that? We incentivize the coach to suggest kids who are talented to our program. If our coaches and our scouts like the kid and offer them a residential program at the Inspire Institute, then any medal the kid ever wins from now, from the time they join the Institute for the rest of their life, there's a monetary compensation attached to that for that coach. So if the kid wins at an under 14 level, there's a, an equivalent of $60 for the medal. If he wins at, at nationals, uh, if he wins at international, that goes to $600. Then if he wins an Olympic medal, we pay them $60,000. So now coaches from all around the country are calling our coaches, our scouts that take this kid, take this girl, take this boy, take this kid. And we then scout them, bring them to our five centers. Uh, and then we train them. We have the we have international coaches. We have the best facilities. And through a very structured program, we are trying to build uh, Olympic champions for India.
Finally, corporate careers, what do you have to say to those who are interested in corporate careers, internship opportunities? What yeah, I think, I think, I think um, like I said, I think India is something that everyone must experience. I think at your age, between the ages of 18 and 22 and maybe some graduate students, I think it is the right time to come and experience India. You may not end up working in India or you may end up working in India, but it is something you need to uh, experience. And we have opportunities in technical areas for, you know, in materials, in JSW Steel, in engineering, in finance, in, in HR, in the foundation where we do a lot of corporate social responsibility work across different areas. Obviously, sales and marketing, uh, sustainability, su sustainability, because we are in hard to abate sectors like steel and cement and power, which are highly polluting in nature. So we need to go green. So we're doing a lot of work on how we can lead that initiative to go green for the world, not only for India and uh, various areas. So there are a bunch of opportunities. Uh, I really think India is uh, worth experiencing, worth exploring. Um, and and yeah, and, and you should come and see the the kind of speed, the kind of traffic and the kind of demand. Uh, you should experience that kinetic energy that is India. So, so yeah. The, this list is available on the website of Career Services. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. And uh, just to summarize very quickly before we turn to your questions, internship location, Mumbai. However, based on the project that you, the project requirement, you could be sent around outside Mumbai, and you should travel outside Mumbai, why not, right? Uh, tenure, eight weeks, anytime mid-May through July. Um, accommodation will be provided by GSW Group. Travel, international travel, and then direct intercity during the internship will be provided by the company. Stipend is mentioned, project allocation, there are various projects mentioned here. I can count about 16, right, 16 projects. And uh, each project will have a mentor and a buddy to ease your, ease you into the professional experience. A mentor and a buddy, good idea. Not just a mentor, a buddy too. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very good idea. So now let's open up for Q&A. Who, who would like to start? We, we have 25 minutes. I, we, I promised you 30, I'm giving you 25, sorry. So five minutes, yes. Can you Introduce yourself, tell, tell us what, what you're majoring in, what year are you, and then, yeah. Yeah, my name's Rohit, I'm an ABCD, grew up in Chicago. Yeah. I'm majoring in applied math and computer science. I was curious about your thesis of how sports would help the brand. Yeah. Could you go into that, and do you see that working with Neeraj Chopra's win? Yeah. And like, what models did you look at? <coughs> For, for this, like, where did this idea come from? Like, why, why were you inspired to pitch this idea? Yeah, so, so just, I mean, I'll give you some, uh, this was the same question that I got asked by the board, right? That board of JSW Steel, when I pitched, I, I, I asked for a $10 million sanction at that time. And uh, they were like, how are you going to measure this? Um, so, so we said we'll, we'll measure it both qualitatively and quantitatively. And, uh, you know, there are various bodies that, that actually measure your brand salience. So one very simple uh, way to measure was, you know, there's, there's a 10%, there was a 10% gap between the price of steel, which is a commodity between us and Tata. Today, uh, the gap is less than half a percent. So that's a very qualitative way of, of a quantitative way of measuring that. Second, you know, there are companies like Interbrand and others who do your brand study. In 2012, when, I, when we started on this program, we were the 130th most recognized brand in India. Uh, today, we're in the top 20. And I think a lot of that has to do with sports. Uh, if I, if I, if I didn't really study any global brands uh, in terms of, because I don't think any global brand has done uh, developmental work for sport. They've yes, they've associated like a BMW, Michael Phelps, or like you know, like now you see how many brands are associated with the Neera Chopra. But but we wanted to do it in a more developmental way. Uh, the inspiration to a certain extent was the Tata Group because the Tata Group has been working on sports through their foundation for a long time, but not at the Olympic level. 
Uh, but yeah, so that's how we measured it. And today, if you look at cement or you look at paint, uh, there's no price gap between us and the market leader. In fact, in some products, we are slightly higher. And if you look at, you know, because of cricket, football, kabaddi, we, we own a team in each of the leagues. Uh, in those cities, the JSW brand has got a huge fillip. Uh, so Bengaluru FC, which for us is a very important city because our largest steel plant is in Karnataka. Bangalore is the capital of Karnataka. So the people of Bangalore are, are, are now very proud of JSW because we not only own the football team, but now they know that, oh, these guys also own the largest steel company in the country. So it's had a lot of ripple effect and uh, a lot of people, a lot of uh, prospective employees also want to join JSW because they see the work that we're doing in sport and they're, they're like, okay, there's someone actually doing real work in sport. It's not just associating with champions, it's creating champions. Um, and and that's, that's really how we do it. How has cricket helped you? How is owning Delhi Capitals? How does it affect JSW? I couldn't get the connection that you... I'm, I'm very interested in, in cricket VR, but how does it help JSW? Yeah, so so um, in cricket, what we did was that we obviously took the, the jersey. So the, the front of the jersey became JSW for a long time. I think last four years, it's been JSW. And uh, there's no property in, in, in the country that has the eyeballs and the reach that JSW has. Uh, I mean, sorry, that IPL like has. IPL that IPL yeah. has. So, so I think that reach and those eyeballs uh, gave us a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of recognition for all our brands. And then also we used our cricketers in a very smart way to, to really propagate the Olympic movement and the Olympic program. So we did ads with Rishabh Pant and Neeraj Chopra. When Neeraj wasn't even an Olympic champion, he was a Commonwealth Games champion. We did a very nice ad with both of them. So, Rishabh is pushing Neeraj. Then we got the cricketers to come to and train at IIS. So, IIS got a big boost, social media and, you know, all of that. We've, we've done that across the board. So, you know, we our, my idea is that whatever money I make in cricket, I have no interest in making money in sport. I want to give that money back to the Olympic program till India comes in the top five in the Olympics. You know, th my goal is very clear. Two things. India has to play football, FIFA World Cup. <laughs> and India has to be in the top five in the Olympics. So, these are the Other questions? Yes, Aryan. Introduce yourself. I will come to you. Hi. Yeah, speak to the... Uh, I've just been told by my staff that, yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, my name's Aryan. I'm a junior studying applied math, economics, and international public affairs. I actually grew up in Bangalore, and I was able to visit the JSW plant in Karnataka in oh. Bellari like three years ago. And we saw the training facility where BFC practices too. And my question was, what you've done with Delhi Capitals, with Bangalore FC, with the Inspired Institute, um, considering football or soccer, as we call it here, uh, is probably the most followed sport in the world. Is there that scalability with what you've done with the Inspired Institute or cricket? Could you see that happening with football in India anytime soon? I hope everyone followed that question, right? So what is soccer here, football outside America? And the question that is put to him is that what you've achieved quite a bit already in Olympics, though you want to go higher, that's very good. Cricket, of course, this is world-class, Delhi Capital is a world-class team. How do you repeat that for soccer? How do you get to FIFA? Yeah. No, it's a very, very good question. So 2013, when we started Bengaluru FC, India was ranked 171st in the world amongst 220 odd uh, football playing countries. Today, India is in the top 100. Uh, yeah, I think we lost to Malaysia, so it was 100 and it dropped a bit. But yeah, so I think I think if you look at in, if you look at football and its popularity in India, it's definitely very popular. It's the most popular sport in the northeast of the country. It's the most popular sport in Kerala. It's the most popular, one of the most popular, one of two popular sports in Bengal, one of the most popular sports in Goa. It's very popular in Karnataka. So, unfortunately for football, these places are either poor or less populated. And the bulk of our country, which is, you know, the Hindi belt, which we call it, the, the, the Haryana, Punjab, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, all these areas, 
uh, our, football is not very popular there so it's it's taking time second on the on the commercial side football is a global sport so unlike cricket where we can bring in the best talent from across the world to come into india and play in football we just can't do that we don't have the money like saudi arabia and we don't have the skill like uh, some of the european countries so it's a it's a different way in which we need to build football and i think with the advent of the indian super league with the advent of now a proper fifa you know tiered structure in india uh football is going to grow and is going to continue to grow but it's going to take one hero to really get football out there so in any sport in india you need one role model so when you look at why women are suddenly boxing in india it's because of mary com why india suddenly started playing a lot of badminton it's because saina nehwal won a medal at the olympic games why if you go to any village in haryana why the kids are boxing it because vijender singh won a medal for india so it will take one indian to go and play in the european league or one indian to go and play in saudi or one indian to go play in the mls for the sport to really catch fire in the country uh, so that's that's what we're all working towards the other other issue with football in india is the domestic game is not that followed because the timings clash with the english premier league on television and digital so people prefer to watch an arsenal versus manchester united other than rather than a bengaluru fc versus mohan bagan and uh, that's changing slowly uh, but but it's a long game you have to play a long game i'll be so delighted if uh, an indian uh, footballer play for manchester united which is my team <laughs> i think they might manchester united so bad that they need yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this year we are not doing well come on <laughs> okay yes there was a question there uh, no no we 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 recording this that's why yeah 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 yeah, yeah. So there's some sports in America that aren't really as culturally important as others. Like uh weightlifting is a sport that you would think we do very well in the Olympics but we do very poorly. Um do you think there's any sports in India that are more culturally relevant that you think you could maybe accelerate the process to getting more medals? Uh just for us basketball is a great example, very important and we usually do quite well. Is there a similar sport in India that you think can get the same uh, effect? Yeah so so that's a very good question um so it's it's less about being culturally relevant uh and it's it's more about where we feel where we see the talent in the country and where the body type the weight classes and the physique actually suits the sports uh so we we support five olympic sports uh today and we're adding a sixth one and those five are boxing wrestling judo track and field and swimming and we're just adding rowing uh as a sixth sport uh and the reason we selected these are are to your point on we we felt with boxing and wrestling there's already a very big cultural relevance to the sport because india has been wrestling for generations india has been boxing for generations um and we and we've already had success at the asian level and and a few successes at the olympic level so we felt that these two sports were going to be the sports where we see progress the fastest and the quickest and that's why we won a medal at rio with our program we won a medal in tokyo with our program we won several medals at the asian games uh, with the program judo we selected because it's very similar to wrestling and it's very similar to boxing uh, and when when i was in japan visiting uh, the japanese high performance center in tokyo the judo cars and the wrestlers they cross train so i felt it's a very complementary sport and we've already had success we 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 one of our girls uh became a junior world champion in judo last year and she's uh, going to qualify for paris and hopefully she's a gold medal prospect at the la olympics so that was judo track and field and swimming we selected purely because it has the maximum number of medals uh at the Olymp- at the summer olympics and it's you against the clock right or it's you against a distance um if you can throw something in practice you can do it at the games if you can swim at a particular time you should be able to replicate that so and it has the most number of medals so that's why we selected these five 
and rowing again interestingly enough we think that india has a very strong chance in women's rowing because rowing is one of those sports where you can build the athlete you don't need any inherent talent for rowing uh, you need strength which you can build um, especially from s- certain parts of our country like the northeast haryana punjab uh, we feel the women have a lot of strength which can be developed and we see that we see them excelling in other combat sports and that's how we've like scientifically tried to select the sports and boxing and wrestling to your point were more culturally relevant in terms of that just a footnote to this uh, path um my impression is and i think we've had this uh, discussion before that unlike cricket where people from very deprived backgrounds some make it rinku singh has made it right but not enough from very deprived background still middle class and above kind of sport huh? and it used to be of course very upper class at one point right kapil dev was the first guy to emerge from the bylanes of of small towns right now uh, but it, 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 athletics uh, uh, whichever d- discipline you mentioned here, mentioned here they all re- the, the those who excel come from much more deprived backgrounds than than the cricketers and that itself is a very important for me it was a very important reason for paying attention to athletics that these are people coming from north east up haryana and not upper class of north east no upper class of the upper class goes went into cricket right or tennis or something like that uh, can you say something about this yeah i think i, th- I think we see uh, real hunger amongst uh, this population set a uh, real hardship also you know they the way they grow up uh, it's really hard and really difficult and uh, somehow that translates into superior athletic ability or superior ability to train harder or superior ability to take pain more and uh, they're doing very well uh, we see that across the board so you're right but even increasingly even in cricket we're seeing uh, that with with uh, you know more and more players from very un you know like a mohammad siraj or a mukesh kumar or you know very very underprivileged backgrounds uh, coming up but but yeah it's cricket is uh, also uh, you know a skill a lot of skill related in cricket whereas some of the sports that we mention it's a lot of endurance and a lot of training which builds the athlete so um, and and obviously places like northeast etc where you they live in high altitude so their lung capacity and all is is definitely more so you're saying that rinku singh has an inherent ability and yes he trained after that but coming from that background you couldn't he could not have made it without that ability that he somehow had yes. somehow had right Absolutely. naturally gifted guy from that background and and ability to train more yeah. because of the background yeah yes oh uh, two three questions wonderful four let's come come to you yeah yeah Um so okay so sorry to steer the topic away from sports a little bit. Yeah, could you introduce us? Oh yeah, sorry. Um my name is Shravya. I'm a first year student here. Um so my question was earlier you talked about maybe like JSW expanding into like defense, right? Could you talk more about that? Yeah, sure. Um <clears throat> so India India as a country has always been buying technology, right? Uh whether in steel making, whether in defense, uh we've been buying technology. uh and we historically have been buying a lot of russian technology uh it's only it's only since uh you know bill clinton and george w bush uh junior that the relationship with the us actually became stronger and india started buying arms uh from 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 the us as well but more than 70% of our arms are russian and the russia ukraine war has really made the government and made all of us sit, sit back and notice the kind of decline that there that is there in russia in general It means there the way the ukrainians have been able to fight the russians itself show that as a economy and as a superpower russia is definitely on the decline also as india rises india needs to develop its own technology right india needs to develop its own capabilities india needs to develop its own ability to defend itself uh, and today if you are dependent on any country could be russia could be the united states and they decide not to support you in an act of war what do you do 
and as a result government has approached some of the larger groups in the country and has asked these groups to get into defense so we have we are one of those groups that got approached by the government and said that you know can you please look into defense can you get into it with a partner without a partner but you need to manufacture in india for india and if you can export from india even better and uh, we've identified uh, several areas where we are working one is one is on uh, you know drones and uh, you know drones powered by artificial intelligence uh and the second is on extreme mobility vehicles which which can you know all terrain vehicles which can go across the breadth and width of the country for rescue for reconnaissance and all and we're working on that several groups are getting into it but uh it's a big opportunity and and india is in a very precarious political situation as ashu can can explain we have china on one side pakistan on one side pakistan not a worry anymore but china is a worry um, you know so we have to we have to prepare our uh, military capabilities uh, army air force navy uh, because that that's as india becomes stronger and stronger economic power uh, the china threat will only become bigger and bigger sir to you uh, yeah. thank you shik Welcome. So I, 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 I was wondering, uh, you know, you you must be familiar with Moneyball, the movie, which talks about introducing data in sports. Are you using data at all in data science techniques, predictive models at your sports institute? Um, so less less in the sports institute, uh, but definitely using a lot of data science and data analytics uh, for building the franchise teams. uh whether delhi capitals or bengaluru fc or haryana steelers i think uh we 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 definitely go through data probabilities the their their stats uh before we select the team um and and since ipl is an auction uh similar to some of the american sports which are drafts uh data plays a very big role kabaddi is also an auction so data and data anal- uh, analytics plays a huge role uh, in you know selecting your team in when it comes to the inspire institute of sport and the work we're doing in developing the athletes uh, we we track their gr- their performance and data plays a big role in uh, us cutting the athletes so supposing an athlete we uh, the coaches feel someone if someone is throwing 60 meters in javelin and in 2 years we the coach expects them to throw 67 meters but they throw only 62 that that's the data we used to like decide whether to keep the athlete or to remove the athlete uh from the program so that's how we use data but not which combination of regimen so that is most effective for which type of athlete no that that i'm not sure about that so i, I you know on that yeah oh let's let's take uh, Okay, we'll continue. Yes, I'm just taking. Yes, please. Yeah. Next, you're next. Yeah. I'm Kritika. Uh, I'm a graduate student. I'm studying design engineering. Uh, I have a question about Bangalore FC. So I think sports is a pretty unique industry because there's like an emotional component, and uh, BFC is has a lot of loyalty and has a very strong visual identity in a country where football is not super um, popular. So how can you tell us anything about how you were able to build that up and cultivate it? Yeah, Bangalore Football Club. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think the first day when when BFC was playing uh, Mohan Bagan, um, I was so nervous that not even one person is going to come for the match and I was extremely surprised when the whole stadium was completely packed. Uh, small stadium, 8000 people, but it was totally full at for the first game. So we we actually uh, we we did a lot of uh, brainstorming on how to popularize football um all the college kids of bangalore watch the english premier league right um, so similar to me i i'm a big arsenal fan somebody is a united fan somebody is a chelsea fan and the question we we asked ourselves is that we're not from i'm not from london 
Ashu is not from Manchester. Why do we support Manchester United and Arsenal and love it? Why can't we create that same passion for something local, for something that is your own, that is your city, that stands for you, uh, that stands for where you grew up from? And uh, we we did small things. We we made the ticket prices very low. We wanted to elevate the experience in the stadium. We created match day programs in the stadium. We created a special stand only for college and high school students, which we call the West Block, where we created chants and we created very fun things. And then that was for like upper, like middle class, upper middle class who chant in English and who you know want the whole Premier League experience. And then we did the same thing in Canada for the. you know the the austin town and the lower level lower level means a less affluent part of the city we made them feel proud we got the kannada colors the karnataka colors into the team uh we got flags we did we did those things right because we said that okay we need to draw people into the stadium and give them an ipl like experience because that's what they used to even if they're paying 25 rupees or 25 cents and 50 rupees which is maybe 50 60 cents for a ticket but we need to create that experience like an IPL match so that they keep coming back for more and uh, that's what we did and uh, success also helps we won the league in our first year um, and and then yeah i think from then on uh, it's been an amazing journey we we do fun things like we we allow the the fans to paint banners uh, we get the players we get the fans to the players homes for dinners we have open training sessions uh, we really we give any any season ticket holder if they are having a child we give them for the first 5 years they get jerseys the kid gets jerseys and scarves free from the club so that that kid becomes a lifelong bengaluru fc fan so small stuff like that and and social media has helped us a lot and having sunil chetri has helped us a lot and and yeah it's been it's been amazing it's been an awesome 10 years uh, with the club um it's 6 o'clock so I, and let me suggest three steps here first would our would our technical colleagues give us 10 minutes that's a question number 1 would parth give us 10 more minutes that's question number 2 and question number 3 because we'll have only 10 minutes we'll bunch questions now right so that's that's how we'll do yeah 10 minutes do we have 10 minutes okay so uh, let's take uh, three questions at a time so uh, from this side three and then we we'll go to three this way right once you introduce yourself bhanu introduce yourself and ask your question very quickly yeah thank you yeah. uh hi parth uh quick question so just okay, sort of uh, bhanu joshi i am here a graduate student in the department of politics at brown um so quickly wanted to shift to a slightly controversial topic so you know you you very uh, you're sort of inviting talent to come to india and i thought you know ashu's written a lot about this democratic decline that india is going through and in as much as you know bright minds bright human resources would like to go to a place where there's freedom you know freedom of expression of food choices of sexuality you know so so and so forth are you concerned with what is going on in india and other parts of the world but particularly india um, the second question and very briefly on philanthropy so you know i was i was reading about 2 million is what you spent on neeraj chopra over the last 3 4 years uh how do you know and i see philanthropy in in some of the other sectors do you see like high high net worth worth individuals investing more in philanthropy in india or is it you know it's been absolutely bad but do you think that number is is rising okay. or is it going to yeah so thank you uh, i uh, no two questions after this only one question for us <laughs> okay okay so, so one more hand with two yeah one each yeah. introduce yourself and, and then we'll go to the next three here yeah. i parth um i'm harsh i'm a third year phd in the engineering department and i started my career as a battery engineer in japan <laughs> um so um this is the thought that jindal is the jindal group is trying to make batteries so are you going to make ma- be manufacture because the demand will always exceed supply uh, so are you, would you be manufacturing batteries also or would you be getting them from catl because i think that's what i read in the news so okay how is this process going to be third <clears throat> yeah hi parth uh, uh, i am vishak i am from bangalore i was at the mohan bagan game the one one draw no that the four nil draw with Ram- 
Yeah, uh, my question is uh, similar to how Reliance is working with youth sports and youth football, especially in India. Does GSW have uh, any plans on doing that and just with school and college levels try and make it an atmosphere like the US? Uh, can it try and commercialize those opportunities? Yeah. So three questions. Freedom, uh, given the state of freedom in India, do you not think that a lot of people, sports people are attracted to freedom? And uh, what is your argument about that. Second, uh, philanthropy. Uh, third battery. question is battery. Battery. battery making. And fourth question was what are you doing for, for in, at the high school level? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, so on the, on the freedom uh, of speech and the freedom of expression, uh, you know, it, it's definitely something that is a concern. Uh, I'm not going to I never mince words and I don't like hiding uh, what the reality is. It is a concern. Uh, but given the size of our population and given the challenges that are there, uh, you know, in any development of any country, I think uh, there are certain pitfalls that will always be there. But I, I choose to ignore certain, of certain things, you know, which are not in my control and focus on the positives which are in my control or in something I can work towards. So I try not to focus too much of my attention on social media. I try not to focus too much of my attention on what the political discourse is in the country and try and really focus on the economy, the growth, the aspirations of a billion people trying to come out of lower, middle in lower income to middle income and really, you know, spend my energies there. So that's... that's I, I might just add, just uh, very briefly, 30 seconds, I promise you. Um, he supported the restless protest uh, in Delhi, and he's, he also defended Punya when he didn't get a medal in the Asian Games. Yeah. Mm. On, on philanthropy, I think the, uh, the, the culture of giving is just starting in India. You know, I think the amount of... Uh, the, you know, the amount of people now who have the resources to give um, and the number of people who are giving is going up. And a lot of people have started giving within India now and the, the government through the Corporate Social Responsibility Act where 2% of the profits have to be given back, uh, that's a really encouraging step and because of that, a lot of corporates who weren't giving are now giving back. Uh, at a personal level, uh, it's still low. Uh, but I think people are more trying to build their own groups, their own companies, their own careers. Uh, but I think as India keeps progressing, this culture will percolate more and more uh, and, and will happen more at a personal level. At a corporate level, because of CSR, it has really uh, picked up on, in a big way. Uh, for example, IIS is, uh, is, a, is an example where apart from JSW Foundation, 30 different, 3 zero, 30 different corporates support the pro program uh, that IIS is doing and we have 30 different donors. So it's, 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 it's definitely happening. Batteries? Uh, absolutely. We will be manufacturing batteries uh, in India. Uh, that's the future. We can't rely on imports. Uh, so we, we have plans of first assembly of batteries, uh, then manufacturing the cells and the battery in India. Uh, over the next 36 months, we should be uh, making the battery in India. What is JSW Sports doing in high schools? No, so on football, uh, so we have our own academy, Bengaluru FC Academy. So uh, we are working to, towards the development through that program. We are not uh, trying to, and we have uh, BFC Soccer Schools, which is a more commercial venture, but very small. That's only in the city of Bangalore, and we have a few centers. Uh, but we are not trying to uh, do something pan-India in terms of football. Uh, we go scouting pan-India for our academy, but that's the extent of which we want to focus on that because we have, our, we have our hands full with the other sports. Three questions. I saw three hands here. Very quickly. One, uh, Shriram Ram. Yeah, Shriram. Um, the, the microphone is coming to you. Yeah, Shriram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Introduce yourself. Will do. Okay. Hi, uh, Bart, nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Sriram. Um, I'm Canadian. Please don't hold it against me. Uh, <laughs> but Indian by, by origin. So I had the pleasure, I'm a grad student. I'm an MPA student here for a year, mid-career executive. And I had the pleasure of being Canada's chief of protocol 
from 2007 to 2014, especially during the Olympic Winter Games. So I was the protocol chief for the Olympic Winter Games, which is spectacular. So just question on 2036, India is bidding. What is that fundamental change? Every Games leaves one social economic change the country really thrives from. What do you think in your eyes that change is? I'd love to know, and from a corporate perspective as well. Okay. 2036 bid for in Olympic bid from India and yeah, yes, yes, go ahead, yeah. Um, hi Parth, uh, my name is Sarvesh, I'm a uh, junior uh, from Tamil Nadu, I study biochem. Uh, my question is kind of similar regarding the future of India as a sporting giant, so the Prime Minister recently announced that 2036 he's planning to um, go for that, uh, potentially in Ahmedabad, which is a questionable choice. But, um, uh, um, but so recently squash is an Olympic sport, T20 cricket is an Olympic sport, uh, and given our performance at the Asian Games, what do you think, um, you know, how, how possible is that, uh, is it for us to expect 2036 to actually happen? Um, but also, uh, to go back to your developmental, um, the things that you said about that, a problem that I've seen or I've rather heard about um, from a lot of coaches and things like that is that there's a lot of favoritism uh, in general and corruption um, in a way when it comes to selecting athletes for various sports. And that's you know held, back, held a lot of people back, especially given that the people who usually um, want to choose sports as a future um, are from lower income backgrounds and so you know when they don't have coaches support and when they don't when you know favoritism is involved they're basically left with no choice but to leave the sport um, so do you think that's something that can be overcome uh, in the future and uh, all of that um, to say that like how far do you think we are from India being a genuine you know uh, last content? question who will ask the last question you will ask the last question yeah here we go <coughs> Uh, hi, my name is Abhijit. I'm a sophomore from Goa, studying uh, math and computer science. Uh, earlier alluded to India being a $10 trillion economy uh, and the entrepreneurial spirit in India. One of the chief problems is the massive brain drain that you may have seen, including many of us probably. Uh, what is JSW as a group and you think India as a country can do to prevent that or encourage uh, those who have left India coming back to India? So, 36 bid. Uh, favoritism in in uh, in um, selection and brain drain. Brain river. How do you reverse brain drain? All right, three things. Um, on on the on the thirty six Olympics, I think it's a very bold uh, you know bold announcement by the prime minister. Uh, I think it shows our intent uh, of really become making sport mainstream in India. I think. Prime Minister, for all his, uh, you know, for all the amazing things that he does, he's also an incredible marketeer. And uh, he's, he's probably the guru of marketing in the country, in the world, I would think. So, uh, I think he wants to showcase India's soft power. And this is, there's no better way of showing a country's rise and a country's soft power than by hosting the Olympics. China has done it, uh, you know, it. in 2008. Uh, we had a disastrous Commonwealth Games in 2010, which probably did more damage than good. But I think he wants to change that. And I think that's what he wants to do. And I think having the Olympics in India, the big socio-economic change that it will drive is A, it will lead to huge infrastructure development for sports across the country. And two, it will make non-cricketing sports mainstream. Uh, so that's on that. On, on uh, the favoritism part, I think we have to go to the root cause of why there's favoritism in sport in India. It's because these coaches don't have an income source and they think that by selecting the players and by taking some money to select these players, they'll make, they make money. Now, by reverse incentivizing them for actually giving us the right talent, what we are doing at IIS is that if a coach gives us a, a talented athlete and we choose that athlete for our residential program, uh, then every medal that athlete ever wins, they have a monetary compensation attached to that. So that's the way we've tried to counter this this greed or this this you know uh, concept of hafta or you know taking money under the table for selection. It is a problem, uh, but it will it will over time dissipate because of you know pro incentives that are that are being done by private organizations by government organizations. 
on uh, brain drain i think uh, i i honestly think that the opportunity is in india i think people are seeing that i think not that many people are uh, you know leaving the country i think a lot i mean at least we at jsw are seeing a lot of people who are working in the us working in the uk uh, applying for jobs to come back to india um uh, and and it's come it's happening in in troves i think even in even in academia ashu can talk about it but there are people coming back to run big universities and big programs in the country so it's happening um it it is a challenge it continues to be because the one thing india can't give today that the west can give is the quality of life because we are surrounded by infrastructure projects going on the entire city of bangalore bombay delhi is all dug up so we have those problems we have problems of air pollution also uh but if if you want to become a millionaire uh, you're more likely to become a millionaire or a billionaire in india than you are in the united states today as an indian citizen so that's my my view well um uh, you can continue the conversation over over the reception outside but uh, it's time to con